This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 12, Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom, ready for teaching on March 19. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 12. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been learning about Jesus and what he did and why he did and what he's doing now, and that the salvation he provided for us is through faith, and that the good works that were needed for our salvation came to fruition on the cross through the death of Jesus. And as we study more about your wonderful grace and receiving an unshakable kingdom, and that our faith can grow and be stronger day by day, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those in Kingston, Jamaica, or Panama City who are listening, or Atlanta, Georgia, or the Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic, or Damascus in Syria, or Doha in Qatar, or in Tonga, or in Vienna in Austria. Wherever people are listening, dear Lord, I pray that you will be not just their solace, but their salvation. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let's read that again, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29, the passage for this week, is the climax of the letter, and it sums up its main concern by repeating the idea with which it started. God has spoken to us in the person of his Son, and we need to pay careful attention to him. As we read in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world's. And Hebrews 12:25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. The description of Jesus in Hebrews 12:22-24 epitomizes the letter's assertions about him. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, and his blood provides salvation for believers. His priestly and royal ministry in our behalf is a cause for celebration for the heavenly hosts. And finally, Hebrews 12, 25 to 29 contains the last and climactic exhortation. God's judgment is coming. It will bring destruction to his enemies, but vindication and a kingdom to his people. Let's read about that in Hebrews twelve twenty five to 29. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, 
Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. The ending reaffirms the importance of Jesus' achievements at the cross and directs believers to the consummation of Jesus' victory at the second coming. Paul used imagery from Daniel 7 to remind the readers that Jesus has received a kingdom from God, the judge, as recorded in Daniel 7, 9-14, and is going to share his kingdom with believers, the saints of the Most High, who will possess it for ever and ever, as recorded in verse 18. But let's have a look. Daniel 7, beginning at verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Sunday, March 13. You have come to Mount Zion. Read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. What does Paul describe here? Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Hebrews affirms that we have come to Mount Zion and participate in a great celebration, as it said in verse 22 in the ESV, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. We have come through faith in the person of our representative, Jesus. In this celebration, we find an innumerable host of angels, God himself and Jesus, who is the centre of the celebration. We come as part of the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, as it says in verse 23 in the ESV. Our names are enrolled in the books of heaven, where God's professed people are listed, as you read in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32, Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And Psalm 56 and verse 8, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle, are they not in your book? 
And Daniel 12, verse 1, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And Malachi, chapter 3, verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance is written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. And Luke 10, verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And Revelation 13, and verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. In Revelation 17 and verse 8, The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. We are the firstborn because we share the inheritance of the firstborn par excellence, Jesus, as you read in Hebrews 1 and verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Thus we have come not as guests, but as citizens. And we'll compare this with Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We also are described as the spirits of the righteous made perfect in Hebrews 12.23. This expression is a figure of speech in which a dimension of our human nature stands for the whole. It is analogous to the expression the father of spirits in Hebrews 12.9, which refers to God as the father of us all, human beings who are spiritual in nature. The festal gathering celebrates the inauguration of Jesus' kingly rule, priestly ministry, and the inauguration of the new covenant. In Hebrews, Mount Zion is the place where all these events take place. Three of the Psalms in Hebrews 1, 5-14 describe the enthronement of the Son and have Mount Zion as the place where it occurred. Let's look at Hebrews 1, 5-14 to start with. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my Son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son? But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed." But you are the same, and your tears will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And then these quotations come from Psalm, Psalm 2, 6 and 7. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And Psalm 110 verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 
The Lord will send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies, and Psalm 102, 21-27, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He weakened my strength in the ways he shortened my days. I said, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Mount Zion also is the place where the Son was appointed priest forever, which we read about in Hebrews 5 verse 6, a quotation from Psalm 110 verse 4. According to Psalm 110, the appointment of the Son as High Priest occurs at Mount Zion as well, as we saw in Psalm 110 and verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of of your enemies. Finally, Hebrews argues that the inauguration of Jesus' priesthood also marks the inauguration of the new covenant, as you read in Hebrews seven, eleven to twenty two. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Thus, Mount Zion also is the place where the new covenant was ratified. Hebrews twelve twenty two to 24 our text for today, describes then the festal gathering that occurred in heaven when Jesus ascended. And so to finish the day, in what practical ways can we celebrate the reality of Jesus, his priestly ministry, and the new covenant in our lives and in our worship? Why is rejoicing in this great truth faith-affirming? Monday, March 14. You have come to God the judge of all. Read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. If this is a celebration, why is God described as a judge? How can a judge be part of or a reason for a celebration? Read also Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10 and 13 to 22. First of all, Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. And we look at Daniel 7 
and verse 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened in the same chapter, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 22. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom for ever, even for ever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. The celebration described in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24, that we've studied in the last few days, alludes to a future judgment. God, the judge, presides, and books are opened, and the result of this future judgment from the books is that God's people receive the kingdom, as we read in Hebrews 12.28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This scene evokes the great pre-advent judgment described in Daniel 7, which portrays a judgment scene in which God, the Ancient of Days, in Daniel 7-9, sits on a throne made of fire and is surrounded with 10,000 times 10,000 in Daniel 7-10, angels, books are opened in Daniel 7-10, and the judgment is decided in favour of the saints of the Most High, who then possess the kingdom in verse 22. Similarly, Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 29, describes a judgment seen at Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, where God, the judge of all, is surrounded with thousands upon thousands of angels. Let's read Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 29. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. 
The scene also is a fiery one, as we saw in verse 29. It includes books because the saints are enrolled in them, we see in verse 23, which implies a favourable judgment for the saints. Jesus is at the centre of the scene, in verse 24. He was described as the Son of Man, in Hebrews 2, who was crowned with glory and honour after having tasted death in our behalf, in Hebrews 2, in verse 9 which reads, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. According to Hebrews 10, the Son of Man suffered in order that he could bring many sons to glory. Verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And we'll compare that with verse 6. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the Son of Man that you take? care of him. That is, in order that believers would be able to be crowned with glory and honor, as well. The Son has now brought believers into Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, through the benefits of the new covenant that we read in these texts in Hebrews 12, 22-24, where they are promised to receive a kingdom, as we read in verse 28. The judgment is, then, really good news for believers because it is a judgment that rules in their favour. It vindicates them. It is a judgment that defeats their adversary, the dragon, who is behind the terrible beasts that have persecuted believers in the past, in Daniel 7, and will do so in the future, in Revelation chapter 13. And so, to finish the day, how does what we studied today help us understand that God's judgment in the three angels' messages is good news for this time? And we've just got three sets of texts to read with that to finish the day. Firstly, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And Deuteronomy 32, 36, For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants, when he sees that their power is gone, and there is no one remaining bond or free. And First Chronicles sixteen thirty three to thirty five. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures for ever. And say, save us. O God of our salvation, gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Tuesday, March 15. Shake the heavens and the earth. After describing the festal gathering occurring in heaven, Paul warns the readers that they need to pay attention to God's voice because God will shake yet once more not only the earth, but also the heavens, Hebrews 12.26. Paul is saying that although Jesus has been enthroned in heaven, our salvation has not been consummated. We need to pay attention because an important event is still to happen. Compare Haggai 2, 6-9 and 20-22, Psalm 96, 9 and 10, Psalm 99, verse 1 and Hebrews 12, 26 and 27. What is the purpose of God shaking the heavens and the earth? What does this mean? Haggai 2, 6-9 For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. 
The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And verses 20 to 22. And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms, I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them, the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. And Psalm 96, verses 9 and 10. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, The Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. And Psalm 99, verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. And Hebrews twelve twenty six and 27, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he is promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And the question there again is, what is the purpose of God shaking the heavens and the earth? What does this mean? In the Old Testament, the shaking of the earth was a common figure for the presence of God, who shows up to deliver his people. When Deborah and Barak fought against Sisera, God fought from heaven on their behalf, as you read in Judges chapter 5 and verse 20. They fought from the heavens, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. This is described as a powerful earthquake a shaking of the earth and mountains because of the presence of God. As you read in Judges 5, 4 and 5, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water, the mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. We find this same image appearing throughout the Old Testament when God arises to deliver the oppressed, as we read in Psalm 68, verses 7 and 8. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai also was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. In Psalm 60, verse 2, You have made the earth tremble, you have broken it. Heal its breaches, for it is shaking. And Psalm 77, verses 17 and 18, The clouds poured out water, the skies sent out a sound, your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and and shook. Thus a shaking signalled God's judgment as he asserts his authority over the people of the earth. The prophets predicted this would happen in the day of the Lord, as you read in Isaiah thirteen thirteen. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. And Isaiah chapter twenty four verses eighteen to twenty three. And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together, as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and will be shut up in the prison. After many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his elders gloriously. For Hebrews, the shaking of heaven and earth refers to the destruction of the enemies of God. 
This is what God promised at the enthronement of Jesus. God said to him in Hebrews 1.13, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Thus, Jesus has defeated the enemy, as we read in Hebrews 2.14-16. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And he has been enthroned in Hebrews 1, 5 to 14, for to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And... You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. But the enemies have not yet been destroyed, as we read in Hebrews ten, eleven to 14, that every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty three to 25 But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. But God will destroy these enemies in the future, when he will shake the heavens and the earth. The shaking of the heavens and the earth means, then, the destruction of the earthly powers that persecute God's people, and more important, the destruction of the evil powers, Satan and his angels, who stand behind the earthly powers and control them. And so to finish today, why is the promise that one day justice will be done and the evil that has been so prevalent in our world will one day be destroyed such a hopeful promise for us all, especially those who have suffered directly at the hands of evil? Wednesday, March 16, An Unshakable Kingdom God has announced that He will shake the heavens and the earth, which means that He will destroy enemy nations. There are some things, however, that will not be shaken, that will not be destroyed. Compare Psalm 15, 5, 16, 8, 21, 7, 62, 2, and 112, 6, and Hebrews 12, 27. What are the things that will not be shaken? First of all, Psalm 15, 5, He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. Psalm 16.8 I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. 
and Psalm 21 verse 7, For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. And Psalm 62 verse 2, He only is my rock and my salvation, he is my defence, I shall not be greatly moved. And Psalm 112 verse 6, Surely he will never be shaken, the righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. And Hebrews 12.27 Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Many modern translations of Hebrews 12.27 suggest that the shaking of the heavens and the earth means that they will be removed and forever gone. The Bible is clear, however, that God will create new heavens and a new earth. As you read in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And we will be resurrected and have new bodies, as you read in First Thessalonians four, thirteen to seventeen. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then... We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And Philippians 3 verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will be resurrected and have new bodies on this earth. Thus, the shaking implies the cleansing and renovation of creation, not its complete removal. What is here will be recreated, and it will be where the redeemed live. There are some things, however, that will not and cannot be shaken. They include the righteous. They will not be shaken because they trust in God. The Creator sustains them and guarantees their survival. Note that in Hebrews, permanence and stability are associated with Jesus. As you read in Hebrews one ten to 12 it says about Jesus, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Hebrews also says that Jesus' priesthood remains forever. As you read in Hebrews 7, verse 3, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. And chapter 7, verse 24, But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. As does the inheritance of the redeemed in Hebrews 10.34, For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. In the final judgment, 
those who hold fast in Jesus will not be shaken, as we read in Psalm 46 verse 5. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Hebrews 12.28 also says that we will receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is a reference to Daniel 7.18, which says that the saints will possess the kingdom forever. This is the kingdom that shall never be destroyed, mentioned in Daniel 2.44. This kingdom belongs to the Son, but he will share it with us. Revelation 20 verse 4 says that we will judge with him the evil powers that persecuted us. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And we'll compare this to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? And so to finish the day, how well do you do now in terms of being shaken? If not so well, what choices can you make in order to get help in this important area? Let's have a look at Ephesians 4.14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Thursday, March 17. Let us be grateful. Hebrews concludes this section by pointing out that the appropriate response to God for all the wonderful things he has done for us is to show gratitude by offering him an appropriate type of worship. Compare Hebrews 12:28 and Hebrews 13:56. How do we offer God acceptable worship? Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And Hebrews thirteen fifteen to 16. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God God is well pleased. In the old covenant system, the sacrifice of animals was the way people showed repentance and gratitude, but these sacrifices were to be but a token of the gratitude and repentance in the heart of the worshipper. Thus, God made clear in Psalms and through the prophets that what really pleased him was not the blood of animals, but the gratitude, good deeds and righteousness of the worshippers. As we read in Psalm 50, 7-23, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I kept silent. 
You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. And Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hands to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Thus Paul invites us to worship God in the heavenly sanctuary by offering sacrifices of praise, confession, thanksgiving and good works, which is the true worship that delights him. We offer these sacrifices on earth, but they are accepted as pleasing to God in heaven. This exhortation embraces all the calls that Paul has made throughout the letter for the confession of Jesus' name, as we read in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And Hebrews 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 10, 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And his exhortations that we continue to do good works, as we read in Hebrews 6, 10 to 12. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labour of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And Hebrews 13, verse 1 and 2, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. And Hebrews 13, verse 16, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. The invitation of Paul to the audience to offer to God acceptable worship in Hebrews 12.28 implies that believers are truly now a priestly nation that has been perfected and sanctified through the sacrifice of Jesus. As you read in Hebrews 10, 10 to 14, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And 
the same chapter and verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without waiting wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This fulfills God's original purpose for Israel, that it would be a priestly nation through which he would be able to announce the good news of salvation to the world, as we read in Exodus 19 verses 4 to 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And First Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And Revelation 1 verse 6, And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. And Revelation 5 verse 10, And has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 to 6 describes in practical terms what it means to do good and share what we have. Let's read that. Hebrews 13 beginning at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honourable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? It means to show brotherly love, just as Jesus showed brotherly love to us, in Hebrews 2, verses 11 and 12. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. It means to be hospitable, to visit those who are in prison or have been mistreated. Hebrews 13.3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. And to reject adultery and covetousness. So to finish today, why is it important to consider good works and sharing what we have as part of our worship of God? At the same time, what are the very real ways that our spiritual sacrifices to God may be corrupted, as you read in Isaiah 1, 11 to 17? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Yet your moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, 
cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Friday, March 18. From the book The Great Controversy, pages 660 and 671, the author, Ellen G. White, writes, During the thousand years between the first and the second resurrection, the judgment of the wicked takes place. The Apostle Paul points to this judgment as an event that follows the second advent. Judge nothing before the time, we read in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Daniel declares that when the Ancient of Days came, in Daniel 7, 22, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. At this time the righteous reign as kings and priests unto God. John in the Revelation says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20 verses 4 to 6. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2. In union with Christ, they judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the statute book, the Bible, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Then, the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out according to their works, and it is recorded against their names in the book of death. Satan also and evil angels are judged by Christ and his people. Says Paul in verse 3, Know ye not that ye shall judge angels? And Jude declares that the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Jude verse 6. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. What does the participation of the saints in the judgment of the wicked, in 1 Corinthians 6, 3 and Jude 6, say about God, and how transparent he will be with us in showing us his goodness and fairness in how he has dealt with sin and evil? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And Jude, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And question two, read Exodus 32.32, Psalm 56.8, Psalm 69.28, Psalm 139.16, Isaiah 4.3, Daniel 12.1, Malachi 3.16, and Luke 10.20, as well as Revelation 13.8 and Revelation 17.8. These are references to God's books in heaven. What kinds of things are registered in these books? Why is it important that God maintains a record of our tears, as it reads in Psalm 56 verse 8, for example? If God knows everything, what is the purpose of such books or records? First of all, Exodus 32 verse 32 Yet no, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And Psalm 56, verse 8, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle, are they not in your book? And Psalm 69, and verse 28, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Psalm 139.16 Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. And Isaiah 4 and verse 3 And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, every one who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. And Daniel 12 verse 1 at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince, who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, 
even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who was found written in the book. And Malachi 3.16 Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him, for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. And Luke 10.20 Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Revelation 13, verse 8 All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And Revelation 17, verse 8 The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. These are references to God's books in heaven. What kind of things are registered in those books? Why is it important that God maintains a record of our tears, for example, as recorded in Psalm 56 verse 8? You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? If God knows everything, what is the purpose of such books or records? 3. Why do you think it is important that Hebrews ends the argument of the epistle with a link to the promises of Daniel 7? Why are these links important in the context of Jesus' ministry in heaven? What does Daniel 7 teach us about the end of all earthly and fallen things? Inside Story Perfect Health by Andrew McChesney Noy was a wealthy woman who oversaw more than 100 workers at a family-owned coffee plantation in Laos. But then she fell ill with a mystery disease in her village. Her physician couldn't identify the illness. Noy went to many medical doctors across southern Laos, but no one could help. Her health grew worse and worse until she could not even walk and was confined to her bed. More than that, she nearly lost her mind. Many times she could not remember people in her own family. All her workers left because she did not pay their salaries. Villagers told her and her husband that she would not survive. At this low point in Noy's life, a visitor arrived from Laos's capital, Vientiane. The visitor, like Noy, was not a Christian, but her son and daughter-in-law were Seventh-day Adventists. She told Noy about Jesus. Maybe Jesus can save your life, she said. With assistance from her husband, Noy found the telephone number of an Adventist pastor in the south and called him for help. The pastor travelled to Noy's village and prayed with her. Noy was encouraged by the prayer and she decided to move temporarily to Vientiane. She wanted to meet Adventist church members and get to know them. When she arrived, she could not get out of the bed, and she struggled to think clearly. Church members met and prayed with her regularly. Gradually, her health improved. She started to sit, stand, and walk. Five months after falling ill, Noi returned to her home village in perfect health. The villagers were surprised at what they saw. They had expected her to die, but she was alive and fully healed. Astonished, they asked her what had happened. Jesus saved me from death, Noy said. Now, many villagers are interested in knowing more about Jesus, the powerful physician who can heal all who ask him. Thank you for your Sabbath school mission offering that will help spread the gospel to the people of Laos and other countries of the Southern Asia Pacific Division. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open an elementary school in Laos. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. 
Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.